Praise the Lord, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. If you have your Bibles, if you will turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. While you're turning there, I do want to give honor where honor is due. I want to thank our pastor and our first lady for all of their prayers and their investment in us as young preachers in the gospel. Amen. Hopefully everybody is there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And for our topic tonight, we're going to look at endure hardness as a good soldier. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Pastor, if you would please pray for us. Bow our head, Heavenly Father, we're so very much thankful for all that you do for us. Thank you for your providence. Thank you have you watched over us, O oh Lord, and we're thankful that you brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light, revealing the truth of the word of God. We can see the mighty God in Christ who came out of heaven through 42 and two, to 42 and generation. Lord, we are so very thankful for all that you do. And oh God, we come tonight as the as your people and the sheep of your pasture. Oh God, we pray that you'll always keep your your mighty hand upon us, oh Lord, for which we are so very grateful. And we're thankful, Lord God, for all that you've done for us. Thank you, oh God, for Calvary and what Calvary means, a double cure, healing for our sin-sick soul and healing for our physical body. And oh God, how you have charted a course for us and you're crafting a life that God will represent you. I pray that always, oh Lord, that you would make us, Lord, vessels that would be fit for your dwelling. Oh God, we want to be vessels that are honorable amen i pray that your hand would always be upon us to help us thank you for the word of the lord that is able to make us wise unto salvation pray that you'll bless these words to our hearts multiply it oh god amen and let it find place in our heart that it may grow and germinate and fruit lay your hand upon sister charlene tonight pray that you may bless her oh god touch her touch her mind lord bring those things back to her remembrance that god she would share your word with us that we'll be encouraged and strengthened to go another mile. Hear from heaven, Lord, perform and do as we ask these mercies. In Jesus' name and all the people say amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Second Timothy, the book, is written as a continuation to First Timothy. And it was written by none other than the Apostle Paul himself, to his beloved son in the gospel, Timothy. It is believed to be written during his second imprisonment in Rome around 64 AD from his very jail cell. Now at this time, while Paul is writing this book, he realizes that his time on earth is diminishing and his demise is at hand. Throughout the entire book of Second Timothy, Paul is laying a foundation and setting some things in order to Timothy. He's telling him to endure hardness as a good soldier, to continue to preach the word and to be instant in season and out of season. And he's telling him no matter how many false doctrine teachers and, and preachers are around you in Ephesus, continue to preach the word and continue to endure in the faith. And as we know, Paul eventually passed, he was beheaded, but before he died, he made sure to set some things in order with this young pastor, telling him to make sure he knows how to endure and to stand firm when the times get tough. And so tonight, I would like to borrow from the page of Paul's book and examine enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and I have four points for your consideration firstly we simply are going to have to learn how to endure hardship 
We're going to have to learn how to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, the thing to note about soldiers is they know how to endure some things. I myself am not in the Army. I'm not a soldier uh, for the U.S., but I have a coworker who uh, is in the U.S. Army, and she shared some, some things with me. Um, they have to go through basic training before they're a, 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 a officially a soldier, but even after they pass the basic training, there's other trainings that they have to go through uh, all the time. There's several trainings that they go through um, on a yearly basis. They have to meet with their uh, specific units and uh, take these trainings. And then even after that, if they are to be deployed to a certain uh, country or sent on a certain mission, they have to go wherever they, they're sent, and they have to endure these things for the sake of their country. And they have to endure being away from their family members, from their friends, from their homes, from what they know, because they have chosen to enlist as a soldier in the army. In our text, Paul admonishes Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier. He was asking Timothy to look at his life as an example and to follow after him as he followed after Christ. Now, this was somewhat of a challenging thing because at the present time, Paul was incarcerated in Rome. And if it wasn't bad enough, there were a slew of other things that Paul had already been through by this time. Now, it's one thing to be a, a preacher of the gospel and to preach the gospel and you have liberty and you're at peace to preach the gospel. And at the end, while you're about to die or whatnot, then you get incarcerated. But that wasn't the case with the Apostle Paul. From the time that he started to preach the gospel to the very end, he was persecuted. From the time that he started, he faced a lot of trials and tribulations for the gospel's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 gives us some of these hardships that he faced. The scripture says that he received 39 stripes from the Jews on five separate occasions. He was beaten with rods three times. He was once stoned. He suffered shipwreck three times. He had been lost at sea, suffered perils of water, perils of robbers, perils by the heathen, perils by his own countrymen. He often went hungry and thirsty and didn't have the proper clothing and the adequate supplies that he needed all the while while he was preaching the gospel. And so on top of these external problems, external conflicts, he had the cares of the church on his shoulder and given to him was a thorn in his flesh a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Now, I look at this list and I'm like, my goodness, I haven't even come close to going to anything like this. But yet and still, sometimes we, we go to God and we complain and, and we're like, well, Lord, you know, the, the, the devil is, 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 is wrecking havoc in my finances and, and my supervisor on my job doesn't like me. But, but sometimes, though those issues may seem real to us, they're really just a consequence of some of the poor decisions that we've made. I mean, if we are late to work, then, then we need to be reprimanded by the supervisor. But yet and still we're like, oh, the supervisor doesn't like me. And we go in and we bring that up in prayer before God. And we're like, Lord, you know, the enemy is wrecking havoc in my finances, but we have tickets and, and our insurance rates have gone up. But, but these are not the issues that I'm talking about. These, though they may seem real to us, these are not the issues that the Apostle Paul had faced while he was preaching the gospel. The Apostle Paul had went through some things. He had gone through imprisonments. He had been through some things, and he's telling Timothy, yeah, Timothy, I've gone through some things, but, but I held my ground, and I stood firm, and I endured hardness as a good soldier in Christ's army. And Timothy, you ought to do the same. And so he's telling Timothy, it's not going to be all peaches and cream while we're living this life of faith. 
Matter of fact, the, the, the difficulties, some of the difficulties that he's talking about here is not just hardships and difficulties that arise from just life in general. There are some things that we face just because life happens to everybody, the just and the unjust. But he's specifically talking about hardships that arise from our lives because we are Jesus' name only believers, because we are apostolics, because we hold up the bloodstained banners. Sometimes we go through things just because we're saved. And these things that the apostle Paul went through, he didn't go through these things because he was breaking the law. He didn't go through these things just because he killed someone. Matter of fact, before he was saved and he was persecuting the saints and he was killing people, nobody was bothering him then. Nobody was trying to come after him. Matter of fact, they were commending him and they gave him the authority to do so. But as soon as he got saved, here comes the problems. And this is exactly what he's admonishing Timothy. Yes, Timothy, be, because you're saved, because you're a preacher of the gospel, because you're a Jesus name only believer, there are some things that you are going to face. Some difficulties are going to take place in your life, but you have to learn how to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 5, when Peter and the other disciples were beaten, they weren't beaten because they broke the law. They were not beaten because they told a lie or they went and killed somebody or stole something. No, they were beaten because they were preaching in Jesus' name. And the scribes and Pharisees that said, did not we command you not to preach in this name? This is why they were suffering uh, hardships, and, but yet they counted it joy to suffer, and they still went about and preached. And so the people that we have for our examples that have gone through some things are teaching us, yes, as people of God, those that live godly, we will suffer persecution for Christ's sake. We will suffer persecution because we are of this faith, because of what we believe, because of the faith that we have. But we have to learn how to endure these things. We have to learn how to continue to hold up the bloodstained banner. We have to continue to stand for righteousness, to stand for truth, because God is with us. God is on our side, and he is fighting right there with us. And so if we can learn how to endure through these hardships, to endure through these circumstances, my goodness, there will be a great reward at the end of it all. And so that is the first thing. We have to learn how to endure hardness as a good soldier. Secondly, not only are we going to learn how are, are we going to have to learn how to endure hardness, but the scripture also tells us that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And so that tells me that we are engaged in a war. Now there are a few, just a few reasons why soldiers exist. There's not really too many, you know, it's pretty much really common sense. They exist to, to uh, prevent or deter war. They exist to get ready in case of a war or because there is a war going on and they are needed to go and fight. Now, in our case, we have to realize that there is a war going on. I know sometimes we don't like to actively think about it. We don't like to have it in the forefront of our minds. We kind of like to shake it off or shrug it off, but there is a war going on. There's a war between good and evil between righteousness and unrighteousness, between God and Satan, between the spiritual and the natural, and somebody is going to have to win, and somebody is going to have to go home a sore loser. And so there's a war going on, and we have to be equipped, we have to be ready to fight in this war. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so there's a war going on, but we don't have physical enemies that we can see with our naked eye. We don't, we're not fighting human bodies. We're not fighting fleshly opponents, but rather what we're fighting is the forces of darkness. We're fighting against principalities. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places, against things that we cannot see with our naked eye. 
And as a result of this, we cannot use natural weapons in this spiritual fight. But rather, we're going to have to learn how to use our spiritual weapons that the Lord has given us. And so in this spiritual battle, guns aren't going to uh, do anything. Knives and, and a physical sword and physical shields and a physical armor. They're not really going to do any good against our opponents, which are spirits. They have no, no bodily components, and so they're not going to be harmed with guns no matter how many times we may shoot it, no matter how many bullets that, that may fly out of. That's not really going to harm them. That's not really going to do anything to them. Matter of fact, they may probably just look at us like, what are you doing? When are you going to realize that this has no effect? But God has given us some spiritual weapons that we have at our disposal to use. And so we are not left defenseless in this battle. Ephesians chapter 6 gives us some of the weapons that we have to use in this fight. And so Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 13, if you can pull it up on the monitor, please. Ephesians, Ephesians 6 verse 13 says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And so as soldiers of the Lord, God has not left us defenseless. No, we're not going to be using natural weapons in this spiritual fight, but God has provided an armor for us to put on every single day because every single day we get up, we step feet foot on the battlefield and we're fighting. Whether we realize it or not, we are fighting this spiritual battle every time we get up raging, a constant war, good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness. Am I going to live for God today or am I going to give in to my fleshy desires? A constant battle every single day. And we have to learn how to arm ourselves with the whole armor of God so that we're able to stand and so that we're able to wage war against the enemy, so that we're able to push back the forces of darkness and put a mark on hell and let them know you cannot come any further. And so there is a battle that is taking place, a spiritual battle. In addition to this armor that we have in Ephesians chapter 6, we also have other spiritual weapons that we need to take advantage of. We have prayer at our disposal. We have fasting to use. We have the word. We have singing songs and spiritual hymns. We have our praise and, and we have our worship. All of these are spiritual weapons that we need to use every single day that we wage war in this spiritual battle. Now, like I said before, sometimes we don't like to think about it. We kind of like to push it behind our, 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 to the back of our brains or shrug it off. We don't like to think that we're in this warfare. We don't like to think about war because war is, it's not a pretty thing. War, there are casualties. People die in war. And so we don't, we don't really like to think about it because it's not pretty, but we need to start to think about it because I don't want to be a casualty in this war. And I don't want somebody that I know, a loved one of mine, to be a casualty in this war. And so we are in this war. And in addition to enduring hardness as a good soldier, we have to engage in warfare with the proper weapons that the Lord has given unto us. Amen. Thirdly, the scripture tells us not only are we engaging in warfare, but we are called to not entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. Now, a soldier, just a, a plain old regular soldier, um, they have to be ready to fight at any minute. 
They could be called upon to go on a special assignment, to go complete some type of special task or go on deployment for any reason whatsoever. The government doesn't really need to give him any type of uh, detailed explanation. They can just say, hey, we need you over here. You need to go. So it really doesn't matter what they're doing. They could be enrolled in some type of uh, class or whatnot, but they have to drop whatever it is that they're doing and go and take care of that task because they're a soldier, they, they are a soldier and an army, and, and, and the same should be with us. We should not allow ourselves to get entangled and encumbered with the affairs of this life. God could call upon us at any time to go and complete a task. And so I, I know there's things that we have to do in life. Yeah, we have to we have to make a living for our families, and yeah, we have to make sure that we eat, and we have to make sure that we're clothed, but, but to have our minds stayed on those things, to, to have our focus dwell there, that's, that's not really the will of God. That's not the main thing. God could uh, have need of any one of us at any, any time. He may want someone to, to pray someone through, whether inside or, or outside of these four walls. He may need somebody to go and minister to a soul who, who's about to commit suicide. But if we're not in tune with the Spirit of God, then we'll miss the cue altogether, all because our mind was, was far from the spiritual things of God. All because we were thinking about that brand new car, or we're, we're thinking about our money, or we're thinking about our entertainment sports, television, jobs, education, even another person, accumulating stuff, stuff that's only temporal, that has no type of eternal weight whatsoever to them. And so we can't allow ourselves to, to not be focused. If you imagine with me a soldier who's fighting on the front lines, there's a war going on, and him and his unit are fighting. They're out there fighting, bombs going off all over the place. There are civilians around, and his fellow soldiers are around in the heat of the battle. When all of a sudden, his mind just begins to wander. His mind just begins to drift, and he, his focus shifts from the battle to back home. I wonder what my wife would be cooking right now, if I can get a home-cooked meal. I wonder what it'd be like to just drive down the highway in that brand new car that I just purchased with that new car scent still etched in there. I wonder what I could be doing back home if I was home right now, in the heat of battle. Battle is taking place right now, and his mind is far from the battle. Not only is he in danger of losing his own life, but he could cause his fellow soldiers to lose their life as well, as well as the civilians that are not even engaged in the war. And I know we listen to this example and we kind of laugh and we're kind of like, well, that's common sense. If you're engaged in a warfare, your mind should be on the battle. But, but we do the same thing sometimes. We don't have our minds focused on the Lord when our minds should especially be focused on the Lord. The scripture says that whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And so our mind should be stayed on Christ. Why? Because if somebody needs to be ministered to, then we're already in tune to the Holy Ghost and we will not miss the cue. We could just simply go and pray for this person. We could just simply go and teach this Bible study over here. We can just simply go wherever the Lord is prompting us to go and we're not missing the cue of the Holy Ghost. A lot of times we may miss the cue just because we're not focused. We're thinking about what we're about to do after service, and I'm guilty of it as well. So don't think I'm being critical on you, but, but yes, we need to be in tune. We ought not to be entangled with the affairs of this world, whatever it is that you like to do. Oh, I, I, I got to watch my show. That's, that's, that's my show right there. I, I can't miss my show. Eight o'clock, I, I have to make sure I'm home to watch my show. My kids don't bother me. Nobody better not call me, talk about they need anything. This is the time for my show. 
entangled with the affairs of this life, all the while, while our minds needs to be stayed on God at all times. Yes, I know we need to take heed to, to the practical things and, and to make sure uh, certain things are taken care of. We need to do this. We need to do that. But, but we need to keep the main thing the main thing and to, and to not major in the minors, to not worry about the details. What am I going to wear today? How am I going to do my hair? What am I going to cook for dinner? But Lord, who can I minister to? Lord, what is it that you want me to bring before you in prayer today? Lord, let my mind be stayed on you throughout today so that if somebody needs to be ministered to, I can catch it and go minister to them. Sometimes our fellow soldiers, our brothers and sisters, sometimes they need prayer. Sometimes they need for us to pray for them and, you know, we're not in tune and we miss it. I mean, I'm not saying that's reason for them to backslide because the scripture does say to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and to save yourself. But, but the Bible also tells us to pray for one another. The Bible also tells us to, to, to pray for one another and to lift up our brothers and sisters. And so sometimes, yeah, when we are focused on God, then we can see that need in our fellow soldiers, in our brothers and sisters. And we can be there to meet that need and to possibly save a soul from walking outside of these doors. The soldier who is not focused on God, not only can he bring harm to himself or his fellow soldiers, but he can also bring harm to civilians people who are not even saved, people who are not even in the faith. And I say this because sometimes when we invite people to church, they're like, oh, nope, I'm not coming to church. I, I knew someone who professed to be saved or who professed to go to church, and that person just, their life just did not line up at all with what they were saying. And so that's why a lot of times they think that church is filled with a lot of hypocrites. Sometimes they do have reason to think that. And so, but, but we as soldiers in Christ, when we profess to know God out there, outside of these doors, we need to make sure that our lives are matching up with what we're saying. I, I have a co, uh, my supervisor, I've been at my job now for three and a half, going on four years, and we kind of have a, a, a new supervisor. She's been there a little less than a year. And um, I had no idea she was watching me, but she called me into her office um, about two or three weeks ago, and uh, she needed me to sign some training documents. And um, I asked her for a pen. I didn't have a pen on me, and she was squirming in her office looking for a pen, and she said a curse word. And as soon as she said the curse word, she was like, oops, I'm so sorry, Charlene. I know you don't cuss. Um, I was like, yeah, I don't. And she was like, you know, as uh, when I got here, I've been trying to curse less. And I was like, really? Now, I don't really interact with this woman like that because she's a manager, so she's not really on the floor uh, with me like my other coworkers, and we can engage in conversation. So a lot of times she's cooped up in her office, and we don't really get to interact with her that much. But the fact that she noticed that, and I haven't really, I don't really conversate with her like that, I was like, my goodness, people are watching. You may not know that they're watching, or you may not realize it, but they are watching you. And then I have another person at work who I don't, she's not even in my department, and she works a complete different shift from me. I work the night shift, and she works the day shift. So as I'm leaving, she's coming in, and one particular time I was leaving, I was in a break room, and I saw her eating her breakfast, and she was like, you're a church girl, aren't you? I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And she said, um, I got to come to church with you one time. I said, my goodness, yes, yes, you do. Um, and so I need to go find her because I don't even see her every day. I need to go find her this week and uh, have her come to back to church Sunday. But I don't even know this woman. I don't even know her name. And I don't even think she knows my name. But people are watching us and they're watching what we do. We are a living epistle read of all men. And we may not realize it, but people they, we may be the only Jesus that some people see. They may not be privileged to come into an apostolic setting like we have the opportunity to do, but they are watching you, and hopefully they will see the Jesus that is in you and not something that is completely opposite. And so we ought not to be 
enamored and encumbered with the affairs of this life, but we need to keep our minds stayed on Christ. We need to be focused on the Lord so that we don't miss the cue of the Holy Ghost, so that we're in tune with the spiritual realm and we're able to minister effectively to our fellow soldiers, to our brothers and sisters, and also to the civilians, people who are not saved, but people who could possibly get saved because of what they see in us. And so lastly, our fourth point is we are called to please our commander. Yes, we need to endure hardness as a good soldier, and, and we need to engage properly in warfare, and we need to not be entangled with the affairs of this life, but we're also called to please our commander, who is Jesus Christ, him that called us into this faith. Ecclesiastes says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And so our whole duty as a soldier in the army of the Lord is to please him, not to please our pastor, not to please the various people in our lives, but to please God. He's the one for whom we are working for. He's the one that's going to decide at the end of the day, have you done works meet for righteousness or works meet for righteousness? Have you done works meet for heaven or works meet for hell? He's the one that gets to decide our fate in the end, in the final analysis when it's all said and done. Not anybody else. And so he is the one that we need to please. He is the one that we need to obey. The scripture says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so we profess to love the Lord, our, our presiding command, our commander-in-chief. And so let us keep his commandments. Let us be a good soldier in the army of the Lord. Let us learn how to endure hardships. Let us learn how to endure the difficulties that arise in our lives because we profess to know Jesus. Let us learn how to engage in warfare and to use the proper weapons to combat the forces of darkness. And let us learn how to not be entangled with the affairs of this life. Because when it's all said and done, it's all going to burn up. It's all temporary. Has no eternal weight, no eternal value to it whatsoever. And so as I close, I do want to close with this. Those who choose to enlist in the U.S. Army end up choosing a higher way of living, whether they join to fund their education, to have some type of job security, to travel and see the world, or for whatever reason they choose to, to enlist. They enter into a binding contract with that country that they will forever be in service to them. They pledge their allegiance to that country. And, and so wherever that country sends them, they must go. Whatever a specialized a ta uh, a task or deployment that that country assigns to them, they have to take those tasks on because they have signed over most, if not all, of their rights to the country of their, servants, their service. And so Paul charges us in our text in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, the army that we have enlisted in. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. The Bible says that better is the end of a thing than the beginning. And I used to ponder at this, like, why? What, what does this mean, better is the end than the beginning? Because I know sometimes when I start stuff, I'm excited, I'm passionate, I'm looking forward to starting something new, a new chapter, and, and I'm excited to start. But the Bible says better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Why? Any person can start a project and never finish it. Anybody can start a race and never cross the finish line. Any child could take on, you know, little kids, ooh, I want to do this, I want to do this, and they never see it through. Any person can get saved and backslide. 
But the scripture says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning. In other words, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And so this is why Paul is telling Timothy, I have fought a good fight, Timothy. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Why? Because I've endured to the end. Not only did I start this thing, not only did I fight for Christ's sake, not only did I get saved, Timothy, but I have crossed the finish line. I've made it over the finish line. I have endured the heat of the battle. I have finished, I have fought a good fight, and I have endured unto the end. And so, Timothy, you need to do the same. So, people of God, we need to learn how to endure the hardships. We need to learn how to endure to the end because when it's all said and done, it doesn't matter how much you know how to speak in tongues. You can speak in tongues from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, run around till kingdom come, but in the end, are you going to endure? That's the thing that matters. Endurance is the key. Are you going to finish? That is the thing that matters. No wonder the Lord yelled on that cross. It's is finished because better is the end of a thing than the beginning now i've been privileged to have been saved since i was the age of nine and at at that young age uh, i've seen many many people come and go many people come in the church many people walk away from the faith some of my own family members some of my own friends Close, people who are close to me that I knew. I'm not talking about something that I've heard, something that somebody else told me. I'm not talking about people who are inconsistent with their walk with God. I'm not talking about people who would come to church one day and the next service you're looking for them and they're nowhere to be found. These people were consistent churchgoers. Every time the, the doors of the sanctuary was open, they were there. Paid their tithes faithfully. Gave sacrificially. They were in the choir, involved in ministry. They preach from this very pulpit. Many people I've seen come and go. I knew these people. These people I looked up to. These people received the Holy Ghost before I got the Holy Ghost. Been saved longer than me. These people, I knew them. I, I had a relationship with them. I talked with them on a regular basis. I knew these people. I knew that they were in it for true. They were not just faking it just for a season. They were saved. I knew these people. And if you were to ask me where these people are now, I would give you the only answer I know to give you, and that is simply, I don't know. I don't know where these people are. Though they've prayed people through to the Holy Ghost, though they've performed the miraculous, though they've done many great things for the name of the Lord, they did not know how to endure to the end. And I don't want to be like any one of those people. I don't want to ever backslide from this faith, but I want God to teach me how to endure in the heat of the battle. I want the Lord to show me how to endure to the end because it is him that endures to the end. It is him that is going to be saved. And so you can stand church. I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know if you have if you're all good, you don't have any issues with endurance or anything for the long haul, then, then I commend you. That's powerful. But if you're in here tonight and you have some issues with endurance, one minute you feel like going to the house of the Lord and, and the next minute you're down and out and you, and you don't know where your head is, you're spinning all over the place. Or maybe... You may be facing situations where you need the enablement of the Holy Ghost to help you to endure. Whatever it is that you're facing, I don't know where you are, but God knows where you are. God knows all things.